Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, and dealer in that order. Welcome everyone to question and answers. I split this into two videos as there were a lot of questions, so uh, I didn't want the video to get too long. So uh, round one is here, this video here, and round two will be in two days on Monday. But let's go ahead and jump right in. First question was sent by Trevor who wrote, if I send in 1930s Babe Ruths and uh, Michael Jordan and Tom Brady rookies in a bulk order with a max value of under 199 per card, if they are fakes, I'm out 22 bucks, but if they're real, I get an upcharge, which I will skip and dance happily to pay. Because if I send uh, if I send it in saying it could be worth 10 grand, then I get charged 500 bucks even if they are fakes. Any suggestions on this? Uh, yeah, that's exactly exactly right. That, that's what I would recommend. If you have a card that could potentially be really valuable, but you you think it's probably a fake, I would send it in at the bulk level, and then you'll get charged you know the cheap the cheapest amount. But if you get really lucky and it is original. You'll get upcharged, and oh well, at that point, you should be happy to pay. I actually did this recently with a 1933 Gaudi Babe Ruth. I was 99% sure it was a fake, uh, but I was like, yeah, I'll just put in the 18 bucks. Maybe I'll get lucky. It came back a fake, but I was out 18 bucks as opposed to, yeah, like you said, you know, 500. So, yeah, that's that's the way to do it. Next question was sent by Grant Darnell, where I have three 2005 Upper Deck Debut Inc. Uh, Frank Gore autos. I'm interested in grading them for resale. PSA has graded the card 14 times total, with 10 of them being 10s. There are only 3 9s and only 1 8. Although my cards look very good, I never assume a 10 as I'm new to grading. This card can uh, be purchased raw for about 30 bucks and is pretty easy to find. And if the pop report already has such a high ratio of 10s, should that affect my odds of getting a 10? Would receiving 9s on my cards be more detrimental to my value as uh, there are so many 10s? So on a card like that, I mean, the, the pop count's so low that it, the, the ratio of 10s really doesn't matter. I'm only, only 14 copies ever graded. That's a really low pop count. The ratio of 10s doesn't really impact anything there, you know. I would say that probably a lot of the ones that did get 10s were graded pre-pandemic when PSA was a little easier on their grading and, uh, you know, they've gotten stricter now. So 10s are, are going to be harder to get nowadays than they were back then. So, you know, I wouldn't expect, a, you know, three 10s maybe. I don't know. Obviously, I haven't seen the cards, but... Uh, assuming they all look super duper sharp, you know, I'd personally maybe be hoping for like two nines and a 10 or something like that. And, you know, if you get a 10, you're going to be obviously way up. If you get a nine, I would imagine you're going to be up a little bit. I don't know. I didn't look at the numbers, but that would be my guess. And if you got like an eight, you're probably breaking even when you're factoring in the, the fees and anything less than an eight, I'm, I'm guessing you're down. So that would sort of be the breakdown. If they look really, really sharp, like 10 contenders, I would, I would think they're, they're worthy of sending in. Michael asked, what's the smartest piece of hobby advice you've been given that for some reason or another isn't uh, always easy for you to follow? Uh, it's a tough one. The, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, way back when I started working at the card store, at a card store, this is 1996, uh, the owner of the card store said, look, if you want, as a collector, if you want bang for your buck, don't, don't open packs. And this was really hard for me to follow. At the time, all I wanted to do was open packs. Whatever the hot new product was, I wanted to buy that box and rip it open and and but after working at the card store for a number of years and sort of uh, just seeing how everybody else you know bought bought packs and myself buying singles versus packs, I mean this 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 advice has just just became so obvious. I mean that, this was obvious 25 years ago. It's still still the case very much today. It's even more extreme today. You just don't get value if you open up wax. Now obviously there's a lot of fun in opening wax, but you know also if you open wax, even if you do get value, you got lucky and you hit something big in that box. Often you get cards you don't want like. You get players you're not that interested in, or you get ins an insert you weren't really targeting, and you just have sort of like a random, it's, it's random. Whereas if you buy singles, you can target exactly who you like, the players you want, whatever car you want, and you just get so much more value. And, and to me, it's much more exciting uh, to sort of seek out a single that way as opposed to open up a random box and randomly get a card that you randomly may want or not. Um, and this is for purely from a uh, collector standpoint, but this took me a couple of years to learn. I just I just wanted to open wax. I had that itch, but that sort of went away over time when I saw how how true that advice was. That that the, uh, you get so much more value targeting singles you want. And from a dealer's perspective, you know this is 100% the case. You can't open wax as a dealer and expect to make any any sort of profit unless you're just sort of like this is like side money that you're just gambling with. But uh, you know. You, you, there is no there is no profit to be made in opening wax. John wrote, I know you're not a speculator when it comes to fresh players and buying their cards, so how do you determine when is the right time to load up on a player for future investment? Do you wait till the end of their career? Uh, maybe if the player has a few really good seasons, or do you go buy a player stats and there are uh, specific stats you watch, like the war stat? So your question would really take a, a, at least a full video, maybe even multiple videos to answer correctly as there's a lot to it. And it really depends heavily on whether you're talking about short-term, medium-term, or long-term investing as each one would have a completely different uh, 
different answer. If you're talking about like long-term investing, you want to invest in a player and wait five to 10 years and hope their card values have gone up, then uh, then I wouldn't touch anybody who hasn't been in the league at least 10 seasons. Um, you know, even someone like a Patrick Mahomes, who is the goat in the sport, you know, best quarterback of his generation, appears to be an all, you know, on his way to an all-time grade. He's only been in the league six seasons. I mean, he could totally fall off a cliff and his career just won't look that impressive for any number of reasons. That's very much in play with him still. He's, he's young enough. Now he could also continue the the greatness and become an all-time great. But his card prices are so high already that there's just a lot of downside versus uh, versus upside for a player like Mahomes. Uh, if you're looking for someone, you know, 10-plus years in the league, I'd look for players who are sort of under the radar. Yeah, using the, the war stat, that's a great way to, to do it in baseball to get a perspective on how great their career is. I've mentioned Nolan Arenado. I think he's a good long-term investment. Uh, been in the league about 10 seasons. His card prices really are not that high. And his career numbers are very, very impressive. You know, you know, long-term, they sort of traject to being, you know, not just a Hall of Famer, but a, a very, a very, very solid Hall of Famer. Um, if you're talking about, like, medium-term or short-term investing, entirely different ball game, you know, one year, two years, whatever, then you can target anyone you want. You can target young players. You know, maybe you think Vladimir Guerrero or, or Fernando Tatis – our card prices are down at the moment because it's sort of had down seasons or FTT said the steroids thing, obviously. So his card prices are really, really low. Maybe you think they'll bounce back and in, in, in one or two years, the card price will be a lot higher. Lots of different strategies with short-term investing. Uh, so yeah, that, that's sort of, I wouldn't invest in those guys long-term, but short-term investing, lots, lots of different options. Uh, and no matter what sort of investing you're doing, I would not touch unproven prospects at all unless you're, you're purely flipping them. Adam wrote, I'd like your advice on selecting cards to grade through PSA and SGC. My father has an incredible collection from the 50s through the 70s. I'm wondering what your process would be regarding the non-obvious picks. For example, I've seen many oddball cards in your high rollers videos that I would never expect to be valuable cards. Examples are the 86 Fleer Jeff Malone or the 52 Andy Pafko. For someone who is less knowledgeable at the hobby than yourself or others, is there a resource that you would recommend to sort out cards worth grading from those that are not? So I don't know that I have a, a good answer for you, unfortunately. Like I definitely can't think of like a resource off, off the top of my head that would sort of explain all that in any sort of condensed fashion that would be use, useful. This is really just a function of experience. I mean, the more the more you've done it, the more you've been in the hobby, the more cards you've looked up, the more cards you've you've sold and, and priced out and like you know researched, just the more you know. And I don't know that there's really anything more to it than that. Uh, I, I mean, I still miss cards from the '60s and you know short print. You know, short print high numbers or rare errors that I wasn't aware of. There's still cards I miss like that all the time, and I've been in the hobby 30 years. So it's really, it's really a, a function of experience. The the more you do it, the the more you know. Uh, if you were, you know, if you have a really big collection from from the 50s and 70s through the 70s, and you're you're sort of new to the hobby and you want to grade a bunch of stuff, I would definitely try to find a local expert who can help you sift through that because there's a probably a lot of money to be made but also a lot of mistakes that can be made that would actually you know could lead to losses so um i don't i don't know if that's an option for you or where you live but that's what i would i would look into see if you can find a, a local card person who can can help matthew asked uh, how do you as a collector investor dealer define an altered card graders and services have their own definitions but as an 80s 90s collector i main focused on the top's finest brands specific to the 96 with the kobe bryant rookies to peel or not to peel the coating there's a balance of eBay listings that the cards with coating drive a premium in value, but uh, does removing the uh, coating create what, what some may deem an alteration in the original card as manufactured? Just looking for general thoughts on what truly makes an altered card. Yeah, good question. I mean, I think it depends on who you ask. You know, if you ask five different people in the hobby, you might get five different answers. I, I always tend to feel that basically anything that's been done to a card makes it altered. Like I, I think a pen mark is altered. Uh, you know, PSA doesn't. They, they give it an MK qualifier. Um, but for me, if, if, if someone's drawn on the card, it's, it's altered. I don't, I don't quite get why that isn't the case. It, obviously, if it's been recolored, everyone considers that altered. Or if it's been trimmed, of course, it, it's, it's, it's altered. But to me, anything that's been done to the card make, makes it altered. Your example of the, the, the finest, uh, so finest cards from the 90s that came with a, a clear coating over it and even says on the coating, you know, re remove this uh, coating. It's just here to protect your card. I think that's sort of an exception. I, I prefer the cards with the coating, again, because that's how it came from the manufacturer. That's always how I want want the card. But I don't. I wouldn't call that altered. I, you know, I think that's. Uh, I think that's sort of an exception where you're you're, you're actually expected to, to peel the card. Kind of like if you were to get get a card from a Sports Illustrated book. You know, I wouldn't consider it altered if they've been separated, even though technically you are changing them from 
uh, the way they came from the manufacturer, but that's something you're sort of supposed to do. It's you're instructed to do that. So I, I, I wouldn't personally consider that altered. I guess maybe some might, but yeah. Next question was sent by Scott who wrote, you've touched on this here and there, but I wanted your take on why certain positions drastically impact card values. The surface level answer is because those positions are just more inherently fun to watch, but I wonder if you'd ever consider doing a deeper dive. For football, it's quarterbacks. For baseball, it may be top hitters versus top pitchers. Uh, it'd be really interesting to do a top 20 of sorts on highest card values for players who don't play one of the popular positions. Also, what happens in a sport like racing or MMA where there's no clear de uh, delineation between offensive points and defense? Does investment just count down to the goats and or to uh, whoever is the most entertaining? Yeah, so I think the you know the easy answer is what you said. It's just much more exciting to watch these positions and follow these positions in the present day. You know, quarterbacks touch the ball on every play. They're part of every high relight reel. They're uh, you know they get all the credit and all the blame when things go well or, or not. And whenever there's an important game, there's always a story about the quarterback, so they get a bunch of attention there. And uh, you know, in baseball, hitters get a lot more hobby love than pitchers because I assume you know they play every day. You can follow their stats every day. You can follow their highlights every day. In basketball, same thing. Much more highlights show players scoring as opposed to like a great defensive play or an amazing assist. So people sort of gravitate towards the the scores. And same thing in hockey and soccer. You know, the highlights are all goal scores. It's not you don't see a lot of highlights of a great defensive play or uh, or even like goalie play. So I think just in the moment, people gravitate towards those players. It prevents a nice long term investment opportunity, um, which I've mentioned. You know, football is the most obvious example to me. If you look at like the most the 10 most valuable players in football today, active players, it's, it's essentially all quarterbacks, maybe, you know, nine out of 10 are quarterbacks or, or 10 out of 10, I don't know, but uh, it's essentially all quarterbacks. Whereas if you go back to like, say the 1980s and look at say the top 10 most valuable players, uh, it's very few quarterbacks. You got Joe Montana and Dan Marino and John Elway in there, but you also got defensive players, Lawrence Taylor and Ronnie Lott and Reggie White, and you got wide receiver, Jerry Rice and running backs and Marcus Allen, Eric Dickerson, Barry Sanders, um, so you see, you see over time, uh, the players at some of these under positions, people realize they're undervalued and, and they, they, they can go up in value sort of after their careers are over as we sort of appreciate how great they were, even though in the moment we weren't really that interested because they, they weren't, weren't quarterbacks. So I think that's a good, you know, long-term investment strategy in regards to MMA or racing. Uh, yeah, good question. I, I really don't know. I, I don't really have any experience investing in, in either of those sports. So I, could, I couldn't really uh, speak to that. Chad asked, what do you think about the new automated grading by TAG? Do you think it will be a game changer for slabbing companies? Yes, yeah, so I don't know a lot about TAG. I've never submitted to them. But uh, the only thing I know is that I met a couple of the owners at the National uh, just in the aisle. for uh, talked to them for 10 minutes, and they gave me like a presentation. Not, not like a formal presentation, just like a very informal presentation about TAG and their company. And from that, I got to say I was incredibly impressed. But basically what they are is a company that, a grading company where it's entirely automated uh, grading. So there's, I think they're trying to eliminate the human element altogether. There might be some, but it's it's essentially eliminated. And it's not like HGA, which claims to have some automated system where all they really do is just blow up a, a large photo of the, the card and then have a human look at it. They have a computer looking at every little dot on the card. You know, I don't know how many thousands of dots or whatever. And then they give the card a grade on a one to a thousand scale, not, not a one to a hundred, uh, not one to 10, one to a thousand with like all sorts of details, you know, in the upper left quadrant, there's this tiny little blemish and in the back on the lower corner, you know, it's, it's that detailed. And then, and then they convert the one to a thousand score to a one to 10 scale for industry standard, but you can go on the app and see the one to a thousand scale. You can see exactly why you got the number it did. You can see every little detail on, of every little border and everything uh, down to the nitty gritty. And so it's like a computer doing it. And, and it's a program that's been developed over, I don't know, many years. It's not like a new thing. So, from what they showed me, it was very impressive. I, they showed me the whole demonstration. I thought it was, I was like, wow, I was, I was, I was impressed. Now, that being said, they're a new company. You know, I've been in the hobby 30 years, the last 20 years of which grading was really a major thing. And, you know, I've seen many, many companies come and go. Uh, basically, it's just been the big three the whole time in Beckett, SGC, and NPSA. And, you know, now CSG is around, but I tend not to sort of jump on board with grading companies until they're really, really established. So I, I wouldn't like sort of, you know, jump on the tag bandwagon or anything. But from what I saw there, I was very, very impressed. And I, and I got to say, I would sort of like to see that succeed. I think that, that uh, you know, it'd be really cool if one of the one of the options that, that collectors had to get their cards graded was truly automated and very, you know, very efficient with that.
Next question was sent by David Bruno, who I think I've done five deals with now, something like that. Always sends me a package through the mail and always goes uh, very smooth. He wrote, uh, since you've been around the hobby for over 30 years, you've seen the ups and downs of the card market. Are you worried that in the slightest that it will take a long time to recover to where card prices were just seven to nine months ago? Or do you think the trend downward will continue for many months before having a slight uptick? So I have no idea what's going to happen with the hobby in the next seven to nine months or a year or whatever. I don't know if it's going to continue to go down or, or bounce and go back up. I, I have no idea, but I, I don't really, I, I'm not really concerned about it. I don't, it doesn't really impact me all that much. The, the way I operate, it has very little effect on what I do. I mean, a little bit, but not, not a whole lot. I mean, mostly what I do is I buy collections, uh, I break them up, and then I resell them. And I'm usually trying to resell things in, you know, within three months or something like that, maybe six months. But not an amount of time where cards plummet and I lose a whole bunch of money usually. And a lot of what I buy is like, you know, bulk vintage, you know, and that stuff doesn't really plummet in value. It might go down a little bit, but it's not going to go down an amount that's going to like destroy me um, in any sort of way. The, the only cards I hold on to besides a few PC cards are uh, as like long-term investment cards or cards that really have kind of been recession proof, you know, they don't go down or at least they haven't in the past. And that is Hall of Fame rookies, you know, high grade key Hall of Fame rookies and high grade. This stuff has just shown in the past to not go down in value. Uh, so even in recession, it doesn't really, I'm not that concerned about it. I also have some cards I put aside as sort of short-term investing. Um, and that, you know, there can be some impact there if the hobby continues to drop, but it's not a, it's not a large chunk of my overall portfolio, we'll say. So it's not a, not a huge impact. And, you know, I've been in the hobby 30 years. I want to be here another 30 years. I, I don't really care all that. I mean, well, I care. I don't really, it doesn't really bother me all that much whether the hobby goes up or down in the next year. I, I prefer it goes up, but regardless, I, I fully believe in the hobby long term. I believe it's going to be strong long term. I think, you know, and, and that's what, what matters to me. And, and for there, I'm fine. So I don't really concern myself with, with the short term, uh, the short term, you know, hobby economy. Lance asked, I was wondering if it's a good idea to invest in CSG slabs if you're on a budget. I buy their slabs on eBay and it is cheaper uh, than sending cards to them. Uh, is this a good idea? So another one, you know, I can't predict the future, but yeah, I think I think there's something there. And I've, I've even done a little bit of that myself. I mean, if you believe, and, and I do, that CSG is around for the long term, they're, they're going to be the fourth major player here uh, for many years to come. You know, they have a, a good company with a lot of backing and a lot of experience in the grading collectibles, you know, space and... You know, I've sent them a few orders now, and I've been very, very happy with the service. And I, I think, I think, you know, they come across as a quality company to me, from what I understand. So, I would suspect they're going to be around for the long term. And at the moment, you, yeah, you can buy CSG cards, cards and CSG slabs for fraction of the PSA, you know, in a PSA slab. I mean, half, even less, less than half, especially with like vintage. I mean, it's just really, really cheap at times. So, yeah, I think there's some upside there. I don't, you know, I don't know that I would definitely say it's a no-brainer investment but i think it's a an investment idea with more upside than down next one said by uh, playmaker 88x who wrote a major pet peeve of mine right now is slabs that sellers sell that have ugly marks or stains appearing on the card from inside the slab resulting from the front of a glossy card making contact or touching the inside of the slab i recently paid a decent coin for a michael jordan card uh, that went through ebay authentication program it was authenticated but when it arrived the card looked, looked, looked terrible in hand due to some of moisture or something inside the PSA slab. I contacted the seller and explained everything and they said they would accept the return, but when I attempted to open a return, eBay wouldn't allow me to do so and stated the items that, that items that go through eBay authentication are deemed authentic and cannot be returned. Three, uh, three questions. Should sellers be required to disclose if a graded card has these issues? Two, does this affect the current and future resale value of the card like this? And three, what is your opinion on the eBay authentication program overall? So that's interesting. I never really thought about it. You know, my sort of gut reaction without thinking it through too much is that no, the, the seller doesn't really need to disclose this. I mean, it's good if they do. It's always better if they do. But this is a legit card. You know, the card's perfectly safe in there. Uh, it, it's a legit PSA 9 holder that's sealed. This is how it came back from PSA. This is more of like something you would take up with PSA if you had an issue than the seller, in my opinion. This is a I don't know. That's just sort of my gut gut feeling. Like I don't know how PSA would handle this, but they, they might reholder it for free. I, they probably would. I don't know. Or or maybe they would, you know, charge you the 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 standard reholder fee or whatever. But that would sort of just be my 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 initial feeling. Again, it's certainly good if the seller does disclose this sort of thing, and and I would give props to any seller that did. But as I'm speaking here, I'm sort of questioning my own answer. You know, I, well, I'll ask you. What what do, what do you all think? Is this something the seller should be required to disclose? Again, my sort of gut reaction is no, uh, but 
yeah, I'm sort of open to uh, to either answer. So curious to hear what the community thinks as a whole overall. Is this a uh, is this should should this be required or or not really? Sort of funny that the seller you talk to is willing to give you a refund, but eBay authentication wouldn't allow it. That's sort of a strange strange policy if both policy, if both parties agree. But uh, I guess I guess that that is what it is. Does this uh, affect the current and future resale value? No, I would I wouldn't think so. I think this card would probably fetch the same in an open auction as it would otherwise. And if you really were concerned about it, again, you could get it reholdered um, for very little money. I guess that can be a slight nuisance, but that would be an option available to you. And last question is, what is your opinion on the eBay authentication program overall? I, I, I think it's a, overall a very good thing. I think there's clearly some kinks in the armor that need to be worked out, including, I guess, this one here. But uh, overall, I think it's a very good thing for the hobby, and I think in the long term will be a, you know, a net positive overall. Next was sent by Tom, who wrote, Why are some of the 90s high serial numbered inserts still in such high demand? Uh, 92 Donruss Elite Eckersley or Frank Thomas trading for over $200 raw on eBay is one example I ran into, but I'm sure there's others. With these numbered to 10,000, I was a bit shocked. Are these cards historic, or is there just that much more demand for uh, from like-minded elder millennial collectors? I'm 37. For comparison's sake, I picked up a Tier 1 Tim Raines auto out of, uh, numbered out of 25 for $22 this past week. Seems like the modern on-card auto would be the higher price based on trends. So the sets that you're talking about, the early Donruss Elite, uh, 90, 91, 92, 93 Donruss Elite, yeah, those, those are historic. Those are essentially the first the first insert sets. I mean, they're the first serial-numbered cards basically in the hobby and really the one of the first chase cards that there is. And in those years, you know, 88 to 92 or whatever, there just were no rare cards. Everything was so mass-produced, and there's just no valuable cards except the occasional insert. Most brands didn't have inserts, but there, this was one example that did, and yeah, so that's that's like a, there were so many collectors in that time that really loved that era and they want to collect some cards, but everything's not worth anything. So this is one of the few exceptions where they can collect a slightly more rare card and it's sort of driven up value and that's why they have a lot more value than it might seem. And yeah, it's numbered at a 10,000, which might seem like a lot, but this is it's 30 years old. I mean, the vast majority of those are lost or in, in, in the trash or you know in private collections at this point. Uh, they're very rare. I mean, if you look on eBay, you won't you won't see many Donruss Elite cards from the early 90s, even though they are numbered out of 10,000. Yeah, today, if a card was numbered out of 10,000, it would have basically no value. But 30 years ago, uh, that's sort of a, a different ball game. Compared to your Tim Raines auto out of 25, you know, 22 bucks, that's a, yeah, that's a great price for sure. But uh, it's it's not really comparable. It's, you know, it's not, it's it's apples and oranges. But that's it for round one. Thank you, everyone, for all the questions. And uh, if I, as always, if I didn't answer your question in full or if you had a follow-up question, feel free to leave it in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer it. Round two will be uh, in two days on Monday. Got basically the same number of questions for uh, for that one as well. So if you enjoyed this, check, check back in uh, on Monday as well. Thanks, everyone.